All right, hi, uh, welcome. So this is uh, part four in our exploration of exploration of Lagrange's theorem. Uh, Lagrange, some French guy, Lagrange's theorem. All right, this is part four of our exploration. And what's Lagrange's theorem? Well, it talks about this idea. Suppose we have some group G, right? We have some group G, we're calling it finite. We pick some subgroup H of G, right? So H subgroup of G. Our question is, well, what's the relationship between cardinality of H, the order of H, and the order of G? In particular, does the order of H divide the order of G? This is the question. Now, is it actually true that the order of every subgroup must divide the order of the group if the group is finite? Right? That's what Lagrange's theorem is talking about. So far, our strategy has been the following. Well, we get some group G, okay? And basically, here's the idea, right? So it's hard to figure out what's the relationship between cardinality of H and cardinality of G. We're not sure. We're not sure what the order of this is related to that. But we've developed these things we've been calling cosets. And cosets are pretty interesting. For instance, what we found is that, well, the order of every coset is going to be equal to the order of the subgroup. So while we may not be able to directly figure out, well, how is the order of the subgroup related to the order of the group, we may be able to figure out how is the order of the sub of the partition, what's the, what, sorry, what's the order of the coset with respect to the order of the group. We might be able to figure out the relationship between the order of the coset with the order of the group, right? So this relationship might be more easy to work with, and that's what we're trying to do here. And so far, the idea we've been pursuing is this. Suppose we get some group. Let's try and partition this group, right? So for instance, I mean, let's notice something here. Suppose we found that the order of the coset GH divides the order of the, of the group G. Huh? What would that mean? Well, I mean, First of all, obviously, it would mean we would be done, right? Because, again, if order of GH equals to order of H, right, and order of GH divides order of G, then that means that order of H must also divide. Let's, let's write this well. Uh, this means that, uh, okay, well, what did, didn't we get a hard eraser here? Right. So then this must mean that the order of H must also divide the order of G, right? That's why it's nice to figure out if the order of GH actually divides the order of G, right? But question, what would it mean for the order of GH to divide the order of G? What would that mean? Well, we notice that what that would mean is that, well, what does it mean for one integer to divide another? If X divides Y, then what does that mean? It means that this implies that there exists some natural number n for which xn equals to y, right? That's what it means for x to divide y. So what does it mean for the order of gh to divide the order of, of g? Well, what that would mean is that there exists some natural number m such that the order of gh times m equals to the order of g. But what does this mean exactly? Right? What would this mean to say that the order of GH times M equals the order of G? Well, what that would mean is that if we got G, we could break up G into groups. All the elements of G could be broken up into M groups. Right? M groups, right, just from here. M groups of size cardinality of GH. So if this group has cardinality of GH, and this group has cardinality of GH, well then, and this group has cardinality of GH, well, we'll need M of these, M of these boxes in order to partition the group G, right? That's, I mean, of course, we're not saying that the, the cardinality of GH, that the order of GH actually divides the order of G. We're just trying to see what it would mean for the cardinality of GH to divide the order of G, right? So it seems to point to some sort of partition because if the cardinality of GH divides the cardinality of G, we've just seen here that that would mean that the cardinality of GH multiplied by some natural number M must give us the cardinality of G. 
which would basically mean that G is somehow partitioned, can be broken up into blocks, M, M blocks of cardinality of size cardinality of GH. Right. So all, of, all we've been doing so far has been leading us to the idea that maybe we can get a finite group and partition it using corsets, and that would somehow prove divisibility for us. Okay, so, so now this begs the question, can we actually do the partition? Can we, can we partition G, right, with corsets, GH? That's the question, right? So, well, wh what do you think? Can we actually partition a group, break it up into corsets of the form, let's say, GH, all of them of cardinality H, and then be able to capture every element of the group? Right. So, in order to answer the question, can we partition G with corsets with uh, corsets GH? First, we'd have to ask the question: What does it mean to partition? Well, to partition, what what does that mean? In in common practice, if we had a circle and we partitioned it into three parts, what would that mean? Well, it would mean we've cut the, the we've cut the the circle into three different parts. There's this part here. Let's call this part A. There's this part here we're going to call it part B. And there's this part here we're going to call part C. Now notice that if we partition this circle, there can be no overlap. For instance, we, if, if we can't have like, for instance, if let's say we got this box over here and decided to break it up into two parts. And maybe one part was, l l let's, let's change colors just to get the point clearer. And let's say we partitioned it and one of the part partitions was this. Right, and then the other partition, the other partition was this. All right, so would this really be a partition? Would this, would the blue cut, like the blue piece, and the well, what's this color? Well, okay, so look, uh, we're gonna go colorblind here. So we're gonna say <laughs> this color is maroon. <laughs> it looks maroon. We're not sure. Let's call it red. So there's the purple piece and the red piece. But you see, the purple piece and the red piece, cannot, can they really be said to partition the whole box? Given that the purple piece and the red piece overlap at this point here. Right? Well, the point of a partition is that when we put the pieces back together, they should give us the entire thing. Right? But notice, if we were to add up the elements in the in the purple partition plus the elements in the orange or in the sorry in the <laughs> maybe not orange in the red partition the end result is that we'll have counted this particular piece twice I don't know if that makes sense so there's a difference like uh, for instance uh, we have a circle right we have a circle like this okay there are a couple of ways you may think of partitioning it one partition is this so uh, let, let's let's get a purple color. So we have our purple color again. Now our purple color would tell us maybe we can partition this circle like this. Right? Maybe one half of it is purple, and then the other the other half we're gonna call again maroon, right? Or red. Right? So this is the other part right here. This is the other partition. Right? Notice if we add these partitions together, we'll end up with these pieces. We'll end up with our our purple piece looking like that and then our maroon piece our maroon or is it red who knows again our maroon piece will end up looking like that and when we add these two pieces together we end up getting the original circle that's pretty clear but what if we'd partitioned this circle differently what if okay so let's assume we have our circle again we have our circle back here we're assuming this circle is the same obviously the art art skills leave a lot to be desired all right so now let's say we partition it like this instead so we have our original orange piece our original purple piece this whole piece is purple and then we went over and let's say got a red piece right? a red piece like this let's say this uh, oh, no no we want to just stick with maroon 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 another maroon oh you know what let's pick another color why not let's have fun we picked green now 
and then we break it up into this green piece like this okay all right so so we have this green piece and we have the purple piece under it well so i mean if we break it up like this well what do we get well one we're going to get this piece that looks like this okay so we've got a marine a maroon partition a, sorry a purple partition of it corresponding to this and then we would have the orange piece as well but notice here that the orange piece and the purple piece overlap so if we try to put them together we would end up with well first would have the purple piece and then the green piece would end up overlapping right and we saw it here the green piece overlapped with the with the purple piece and over here as well so if we're to add up the elements we'll end up getting some extra addition here some extra piece so when we talk about partition here let's focus I mean there's no reason why this wouldn't be a partition but we want to focus on partitions that don't have repetition that have no overlap for example this one the purple things are in the purple and the maroon things are in the maroon the here the the purple things are in the purple and the green things are in the green but there's an overlap and we don't want this overlap because um, how can we really make sure we uh, wh wh why is this idea important to us so right right so let's say we had a set okay we have a set right let's let's work with a set instead okay let's let's go to normal colors now back to black all right black is the cool color so we're sticking with black all right so we're back to black and here's the idea well let's say I mean the set the group G we're talking about it contains I mean it has different structures sure but ultimately the group G just consists of element G elements that is G1 G2 G3 maybe up to GK or something right the group G consists of just a bunch of elements a set what does it mean to partition a set is the question right so for instance if we had the set I don't know X equals to one two three four five six well if you want a partition it's such that when we combine the partitions we get the same uh, set back then we have to be careful right so for instance I mean okay let, let, let's let, let, let we could partition the set X in a couple of ways let's think of a couple of them. this here's the set X one partition could be replaced one over here okay then the next partition could have two three the next partition could have three four five the next partition could have six okay. so have we partitioned the set sure if we got all the elements here and combined them with the number of elements here and combine them with the number of elements here and combine them with the number of elements here the overall sum should give us the total what's the cardinality of X in this case well X has just six elements in it right. so if we call this first partition the first partition here let's call it uh, partition one this other piece we're going to call partition two this other piece we're going to call partition three this other piece we're going to call partition four now we notice that if we add up the cardinality of partition one plus the cardinal cardinality of partition two plus the cardinality of partition three plus the cardinality of partition four what do we end up with well cardinality of partition one is how many elements are there in the first partition how many are there well it's just one isn't it how many elements are in partition four well there's two of them how many elements are in partition three there's three of them how many elements are in partition four there's six of them sorry <laughs> there's one of them when we add them all up what do we get uh, oh did we do this correctly oh geez geez actually we have a problem here right so oh this is actually a good instructive example so if we add them up what do we end up with we end up with well one two one plus two plus three plus one which gives us what seven so does the sum of these partitions does the sum of the cardinality of the partitions we got equal to the cardinality of X well no cardinality of X was seven now we, it was six but we summed up the partitions and got seven well what went wrong the thing that went wrong is the fact that yeah maybe that's a question think about it for a few seconds why is it that when we s summed up the cardinalities of the partitions we didn't end up with 
the cardinality of the entire set X so set X well one we, we hope that the realization was that part of the reason why summing up the partitions did not give us the cardinality of the entire set is because the partitions are not disjoint we for example we double counted three three was in the first partition was also in the second partition right so I mean we could have fixed this by creating a partition of X that is completely disjoint for instance it could have been maybe one this could have been maybe had the element three four this could have had the element two and let's say this one had the element what are we left with in this thing uh, six and five okay the partitions have different sizes sure but if you sum up this partition and this partition and that partition and that partition the end result is we end up with one element plus two elements that's three elements plus an extra element that's four elements plus an extra two that's six elements now suddenly the sum of these partitions let's call this partition one let's call this partition two call this partition three and call this partition four suddenly the sum of the partitions one plus partition two plus partition three plus partition four well the sum of those is actually giving us six which is exactly the number of elements there are in the set X which was said to have cardinality six so this let's now reframe the question let's reframe the question if we had some set X any set X right so it's not necessarily that it's not the set X that we created before maybe to avoid confusion confusion let's give it another name let's get a hard eraser here so let's give it another name let's say let's suppose that we have some collection let's say we had some set Y and Y contained the elements any element uh, I know, what do you want to say alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 alpha 4 let's say it contained all the way up till what's your favorite number let's say alpha m okay let's say these are the elements of some set y what kind of partition will enable us to what kind of partition will, will enable us to gain the cardinality of y obviously what's the cardinality of y here well the cardinality of y here is just m isn't it because there's m elements so the question becomes what sort of partition of the set y would enable us to ensure that when we sum up the partitions we get the cardinality of y back right. or better put if we got our set y and we broke it up into partitions we partitioned it right maybe let's say up to there let's say we broke it up into k partitions so this was um, okay let's call this uh, partition one we're gonna call this partition two okay, maybe let's say we added another partition and now we're gonna go dot 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 there we're gonna call this partition three let's call this maybe partition k all right let's say we partitioned the set y into these k partitions what would have to be true about part the partitions p1 p2 all the way to pk so that the cardinality of p1 plus the cardinality of p2 plus the card up to the cardinality of pk so that all of that gives us the cardinality of y let's repeat the question again if we got the set y and broke it up into k partitions partition one partition two partition three up to partition k what would have to be true about these partitions p1 to pk p1 p2 all the way to pk such so that the sum of the cardinalities of these partitions sum of cardinality of p1 sum of the cardinality of p2 plus all of them the sum of all of these partitions gives us y what would have to be true about the partitions themselves so given what we've been discussing before what do you think the answer to this question is so it does indeed it becomes clear then that one thing that has to be true well at least if we wanted to guarantee right if we wanted to guarantee that this partition sum to y wait, what what would have to be true about the partitions okay is the question all right so 
Okay, let's 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 put this in a much better space. We've just run out of space. So, okay. So that that is the that is the key question now. Oh, geez, did we? Uh, yeah, we just shifted things. Okay. So that's that. That seems to now be our key question. So if we got h, if we got y, and broke it up into partitions, okay, this way, partition one, partition two, partition three, partition k, right, and we had some set y that contained the elements alpha one, alpha two, all the way up till alpha some alpha m, right? The question we're asking is, well, what has to be true about partitions one, two, all the way till k, so that we can conclude that cardinality of partition one plus cardinality of partition two plus cardinality of partition three plus dot 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 plus all of this equals to cardinality of y right so what conditions would we need to establish this fact well i mean one thing we notice that well all these partitions have to be disjoint why because if the partitions are not disjoint what well, first of all okay right so there are probably many things we can do about these partitions but let's set up a set of conditions that will guarantee that these partitions actually add up to y suppose we did the following well first suppose we made sure that every element of y every y okay so suppose we set up the following conditions every y is in some partition so uh, the pen is misbehaving as usual. All right. So. All right. All right. So this is what we're saying. Um, every y is in some partition. Right? Some partition right here. Okay. Uh, so this is supposed to be partition. Hope it's uh, clear to read. Right. Partition. So suppose we said the following, that every element of y is in one of these partitions. That is, if we looked at any of these elements, let's say alpha sub i in y, if we looked at alpha sub i element of y, we're saying that we want to make sure that alpha sub i, well, lies in some of these things, one in, in one of these partitions. That is, alpha sub i is an element of p sub j, right? where p sub j is some partition, is one of the p1, p2 to pk, is one of the pi's, if you like, the pj's. So that's one thing we are guaranteeing. And suppose we say this as well, we said the second condition. Okay, maybe question. If we, if the first condition is that every element of y must be in one of these partitions, what does our second condition need to be in order to guarantee that the sum of these partitions always gives us the cardinality of y. Right? Repeat. Given that this condition is true, that every y is in some partition, every element of y is in some partition, what needs to be true? What other condition do we need in order to guarantee that the sum of all these partitions gives us the cardinality of y? Well, quick thinking will help us to realize that one thing we could guarantee is that all all partitions all the partitions all the pi's one other condition would be this all the partitions are pairwise right, so this is another thing we could say that all the partitions are pairwise disjoint So the pen is misbehaving big time but okay so if every y is in some partition and we say that every all the partition what does it mean when you say pairwise disjoint it means that 
no two no two pairs of dis of partitions have an element in common what that means is that if we picked alpha i element of y it doesn't matter where it is it, i mean first of all alpha i by the first condition alpha i has to be in some partition so alpha i is in one of these maybe it's in partition 3 maybe alpha i is in partition 3 but if we say that the partitions are pairwise disjoint we're also saying that alpha i can never be in any other one of these partitions because if we consider the pair partition through partition one if they're pairwise disjoint it means that alpha i can't be in p1 alpha i also can't be in p2 can't be in p4 can't be in p5 can't be in pk right so that's what it means that means that all of basically see if you can convince yourself Right. That's that's a challenge. Can you convince yourself that if we guarantee that every element of Y is in some partition, and we say that all partitions are pairwise disjoint, can you convince yourself that these two conditions would imply that we are getting all of the elements of Y, and we are placing placing them in these partitions in such a way that if we added up how many elements are in each partition? Partition 1, Partition 2, Partition 3, if we sum up all the elements that are in the partitions, we'll always end up with the size, the cardinality of the, of the set itself, that we start, of the set Y that we started with. Right. So, so that's what, uh, this actually turns out to be true, but please convince yourself that it is true, that all we need to show that there may be many ways to partition this set so that the sum of the cardinality of the partitions gives us the cardinality of Y back, but one way that would guarantee it, one, one of the ways that would guarantee it is if we ensure that every element of Y was in some partition, and we also ensure that, that's the first condition, every element of Y is in some partition, and we also ensure that all the partitions are pairwise disjoint. With these two conditions, we guarantee that the sum of the cardinalities of the partitions gives us the sum of the cardinality, of, gives us the, is equal to the cardinality of Y. Right? Well, okay, so like, fine, 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 Christian, fine, this is convincing, but what does it have to do with Lagrange's theorem? Here we're starting with some random set Y. What does it have to do with groups and subgroups and cosets? Okay, so let's deal with that, right? So remember our two conditions. So how would we translate this to cosets is the question. Okay, let's say we have some group G, right? We have our group G, right? The group G has elements, let's say... Uh, okay, let's let's not let's. Uh, this is not completely important. That let's write it like this. Suppose we have our group G over here, right? G one, G two, let's say our group G has m elements up to G m. Okay. Now, by the same idea, well. If we wanted to partition G, right? Right. So, what if we can partition G as follows? That is, okay. Let's take some subgroup H of G. Let's take H subgroup of G, right? Now, H is a subgroup of G. What if we were able to break down G into the following partitions? Partition one. Partition two let's say all the way up to partition k right, some k and here here the partitions are just you could think of the partition as a subset of g it, it contains elements of g and let's make the following let's require the following things be true one that at the moment the, sub, the subgroup seems irrelevant but it's not let's guarantee the following conditions one is Okay, each partition, let's guarantee that each partition is actually some coset. So let's say that every PI equals to GH. Right? Right. So all these partitions are basically, uh, first of all, let, let's, let's see if, let's see if uh, we agree with the following statement. One, suppose we said the following, that each PI equals to, gh 
that is each partition is some corset some left corset of h okay that's each pi uh maybe write it better um let's get a hard eraser all right first condition suppose we proved this that each pi each partition is a corset gh and suppose we prove the following as well suppose we also prove that each g element each gj element of g is in some partition is such that uh let's see let's write this is such that uh, do you want to write it in full? Okay, okay. Then let's 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 just write it better. But writing is not really the biggest concern right now. It's more understanding. So suppose we prove this. Suppose this were true as well. For each gi element of G, we can conclude the following. It implies that gi is actually in some partition. Gi is an element of one of the partitions, the pi's. Suppose this were true, which means, of course, if the, by the first condition, this means that gi is an element of pi, which equals to some corset. We don't know what it is. Maybe let's call it gl. <laughs> we're using a lot of subscript, but basically we're saying that every element of the group is in some of one of these partitions. That's the second condition. And let's say we set up the third condition as follows. We said that the pi, the partitions the partitions are pairwise disjoint okay suppose we establish these three conditions that is we got our group we partitioned it and each partition is one of these core sets okay each partition is one of these core sets okay and each each element of the group is in one of the core sets. That's the second condition. And we've also guaranteed that each partition, the partitions are pairwise disjoint. That is, you can't get some element of the group and find it in one partition and also in another partition. So every element is found in one and only one partition. If we establish all these three conditions, would we be able to conclude the following? That if we added up the cardinality of P1, to the cardinality of the second partition all the way till the cardinality of the how many partitions do we have k partitions the cardinality of the kth partition if we if these three conditions are true would we be able to conclude that the sum of all of these that the sum of all of these partitions gives us the cardinality of the cardinality of the group would that be true Please convince yourself that this is true. That, in fact, actually, the third condition is the first condition is. We don't even need the first condition to conclude the, this part of the this part of our demonstration here. That, all we need is every element of G has to be an element of the partitions. That's a, that's the condition we need to be sure. For each GI, GI is in some partition. The next condition we need to be true is that the partitions are pairwise disjoint. With those two pieces of information, as we saw before. When we're trying to partition x here, partition y, it's the same thing as well here. That this would conclude the sum of the, part, the cardinality of the partitions equals the cardinality of g. Please convince yourself that conditions two and three together imply that the sum of the partitions must equal to the cardinality of the group. All right. So if you've convinced yourself that the, the conditions two and three imply that uh, the, the sum of these partitions equals the cardinality of the group g, let's now proceed. Well, we said that each pi is some corset, right? So let's just label these corsets as follows. So P, P1 is going to be G1H for some G1 element of G, right? For G1 element of G. P2, P2 is going to be G2H for some G2 element of G, right? So really what we're saying here is that this statement, the sum of the pi's gives us cardinality of g, could be rewritten as follows. The cardinality of g1h 
plus the cardinality of G2H, here we're just substituting. P1 is G1H, P2 is G2H, some left corset, right? and this is where condition 1 comes in. Condition 1 enables us to say this, because we said that each partition is some left corset. Right? So G, G1H equals to this, plus G2H equals to that, and we're saying, okay, the third partition would also just give us cardinality of G3H, and we'd continue this process, and our equation is telling us that when we sum up all those things, all the way up to G sub K P K, well, the end result is cardinality of G, right? Oh, oh this is not P K, geez, okay, that's actually H, 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 left core set of H formed by G sub K, H, okay? Right, so, again, no magic here, all we just said was, because this first equation is true, we just substitute the value of P1 for its left corset, the value of P2 for its left corset, the value of PK for its left corset. We sum up their cardinalities. We sum the cardinalities, we should still get cardinality of G. That's what the first equation was telling us. But what's the cardinality? We proved before that for any, for we proved before the following fact that for any left corset GIH, the cardinality of GIH equals the cardinality of H. Right. So what are we saying here? We're saying that cardinality of H, right? So that means that this cardinality of G1H could, is just the same as cardinality of H. So this equation can be rewritten as follows. Cardinality of H plus, well, cardinality of G2H is just cardinality of H, so plus cardinality of H. Cardinality of G3H is just cardinality of H, plus cardinality of H, plus, 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 plus cardinality of H, all of them gives cardinality of H, all of that equals to G. Question, how many cardinality of H's do we have here? Answer, well, as many ad, ad, we have as many cardinality of H's as there are elements, things that we are summing up. Well, how many things are we summing up? One, two, three, up to K. So we have K H's. That means that we could rewrite this cardinality of H plus cardinality of H plus cardinality of H K times the same as K times cardinality of H. So we're saying K times cardinality of H equals to cardinality of G. But if K times cardinality of H equals to cardinality of G, what does that mean? Well, that's by definition what it means because K, is, was, K was chosen to be some natural number. So what we're really saying here is that cardinality of H actually divides cardinality of G, which is actually Lagrange's theorem, isn't it? So. Are we done? Think about that. Are we done? Have we completed the proof now that for any group G, if we take any subgroup of the group G, then the cardinality of the subgroup must divide the cardinality of the group? Are we done? Well, the true answer is we're almost done, but we're not. And the reason we're not done is because we said <laughs> what we've just shown is that if these three conditions are true, if we got a group G, picked some subgroup H of G, and then made partitions, let's say K partitions, where each of the partitions was some corset, if the first condition was true, if each of the partition was some left corset of H, and if each element was actually in one of these, if uh, each element of the group was in, the co was in one of these corsets, and if the corsets were pairwise disjoint, we said if these three conditions are true, then indeed Lagrange's theorem is true. But you see, we notice we're saying if. How can we be sure that these three conditions are true? How can we be sure that, right, so that's the question now. So our, if we can prove that these three conditions are true for any group, we'll have proved basically Lagrange's theorem. So now our challenge has completely shifted. Here's now, here's what our challenge has now become. Our challenge is now the following. If G is a group, this is what we need to prove need to prove this is now a new strategy we need to prove the following that if g is a group and h or actually not just a group but the following if if um okay the pencils misbehaving again if g is finite right so g is finite if g is a finite group so the finite part turns out to be important. If G is a finite group, figure out, try figuring out why finiteness is important. We're saying if G is a finite group and 
h is a subgroup of g, our task is to prove the following. One, that we can partition g. We can partition g into partitions p1, p2, all the way till some natural number pk, such that the following conditions are true. One, for all g in g, g is an element of one of these partitions, is an element of one of the pi's. Two, pi intersect pj, right? for any two partitions, their pairwise disjoint, that is the intersection of the any two partitions equals to the empty set, they are disjoint, for i not equal to j. And three, we need to make sure that each pi, each pi equals to g h, that is for some g in g, that is each of the partitions is actually a left corset. corset. If we can show these three conditions, we're basically done and have proved Lagrange's theorem. Okay, we just run out of time there. All right, so that's where we're at now, proving these three conditions, and if we can prove them, then we'll have proved indeed that for any subgroup of a finite group, cardinality of H divides cardinality of G. So let's end here, and in the next video, we'll try and see whether these conditions are true. In the meantime, please try to figure out why, if a group is finite, and H is a subgroup, we can partition it in such a way that every element of the group is in one of these partitions, the partitions are pairwise disjoint, and every element, every partition is actually a left corset of H. See if you could prove this, and then in the next video we'll, we'll try to explore why this thing is true, why these three conditions have to be true for any finite group whose subgroup is G, whose subgroup is H. All right, thanks very much for listening, and... Uh, have a relentless week. Bye.